Okay, well, welcome everyone to um, our presentation today. This is part of our wellness committee presentations that we've been doing on a fairly regular basis. Every month we're doing something, and in honor of Halloween being this month, we thought dental health would be an important topic. Not that any of us really need a lot of that in terms of the candy, but maybe. So we're very fortunate to have Dr. Johnny Fisher here today with us. He's a local dentist, and I'm not going to introduce him any further because he has his own introduction that he's going to give, and please welcome him. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm a back row kind of person as well. You guys are all... So that's good. I am. That's true. That's true. In, in class pictures, I'm always in the back. So, okay. Um, so I was going to start with a little introduction. Um, there's slides. Um, I I enjoy teaching, but I also enjoy keeping people interested. So um, there's there's uh, there should be a little bit of something in here for everybody. I know that we have a um, you know, we could we could all kinds of a mixed uh, background as far as what people's experience are and, and what their what their work is. Um, so this will hit a little bit of the more nitty gritty of um, your health and oral hygiene and, and medicine and dentistry, um, and also a lot of uh, a lot of overview of how medicine and dental are related and can work together. Um, and uh, hopefully, hopefully you'll learn something today. So who am I? Well, this is my family. Um, this is taken over in Moscow. Uh, there's uh, Felix, Samantha, Charlie, my wife, who's here today, um, and then Rue is our is our youngest. Um, Natalie's my sweetheart. This is uh, this is when we were at a trip to Alaska, and we had uh, we got to go to do some dog sledding, and that was the the do the puppies of the of the uh, of the dogs are everyone's everyone's favorite. And uh, people always wonder if if dogs enjoy dog sledding, and they do. There's a there's a yard of hundreds of dogs, and when they go to start hooking them up, they all bark like crazy because they want to be the one that gets hooked up to the to the dog sled. So, uh, so that was fun. Uh, and here's our kids, um, all of them very different personalities, but uh, but really sweet kids. So all about me. So I started. I started kind of as you see me now with not a lot of hair, and uh, we've, we've kind of come full circle. It's, it's drifted down onto my face. Um, I also was uh, a big fan of, of, uh, of Superman. This is, uh, this is my brother, and, uh, and my sock is not quite up there, but, uh, and ever since then, I've had really sharp elbows. I'm, I'm, when I play basketball, I'm, my elbows are one of my... Um, one of my best weapons. Well, so I grew up in the I grew up in the military. My dad was an Air Force dentist, and so that that was my introduction to dentistry. Uh, we moved all over the place. Um, I ended up in Ramstein, Germany, to go to high school. I went three years to high school at Ramstein, Germany, uh, which is just uh, south of Frankfurt, about an hour and a half. I went three years there um, to to high school. After graduating. Um, I served in a uh, mission uh, in the Washington uh, Spokane area, actually down by Tri-Cities. I served a two-year mission um, and learned to speak Spanish, so uh, that comes in handy now and again with, uh, with speaking some Spanish. After that, I went to Brigham Young University. I finished out uh, my undergraduate in exercise science, so I have a background in biomechanics and kinesiology, and that, that comes, in, uh, comes in handy now and again as well. I then went to dental school at University of the Pacific in San Francisco, and it's the only it's the only three-year dental school that's still in existence. Um, back in the 70s, when they were trying to consolidate the cost of dental school, they um, probably a half dozen or so dental schools were able to squeeze all the curriculum into three years. Um, but over time, they added on those other years, except for um, Pacific was able to keep that, and so um, it's a pretty fast-paced. Um, dental school with uh, but I uh, got excellent training there um, and that was uh, three years I graduated in uh, 2007 and then I went into the Air Force um, this was uh, my residency I spent a one-year 
advanced education and general dentistry at the Air Force Academy. This is the Air Force Academy back down here. There's the Air Force Academy Chapel, if you, if you recognize that. Um, and we worked on cadets, we worked on um, family members, and we worked on the support personnel uh, of that area. So the cadets, we took out a lot of wisdom teeth. They have, uh, they have to uh, get prepared to be uh, pilots. A lot of them want to be pilots. And so we got a, I got a lot of uh, good advanced training, kind of like an extra year of dental school there. Then we moved to Oklahoma, and this is what you do in Oklahoma. You go, uh, you go mud bogging, and uh, and you buy a and you buy a wide brimmed hat. So this is me and my wife. Uh, we uh, we did some some off roading. I uh, spent two years in Oklahoma at an Air Force base, kind of in the middle of nowhere, and uh, finished up uh, my Air Force career. Those were that was three years, and then we moved here to Pullman um, about three years ago. So we've been here. Um, I acquired a practice, and we recently moved locations um, about, about a year ago. Um, this is my team uh, that, that works with me. Nancy's my office manager. She's not with us here today. Her mom is sick um, up at uh, Sacred Heart in Spokane. Just last night, she had uh, an emergency life flight, so she's not with us today. Uh, so our prayers, our prayers are with her. Um, but uh, I've got some other team members here. Corinne, my dental hygienist. She can give us a little wave. There's Corinne. And then Sherry, my lead dental assistant. And then Jen is our other dental hygienist. And then Brooke, and I don't think I have a picture of Alex for some reason, and Alex is back there. <laughs> okay, and then Brooke is our, Brooke is our receptionist. Um, <clears throat> this is our new location that we moved to about a year ago. Um, here we are at the hospital right here, and then just down the street by the Great Clips. Um, we, uh, we moved into our new office, and it's really nice um, to have a new facility. It doesn't smell like a dental office. That's always kind of nice. And um, so our mission is to provide excellent comprehensive dental care in a comfortable, family-friendly environment. So that's our, so that's our goal. So <clears throat> that's, that's me in a nutshell. So keeping it clean, your health and oral hygiene. So. Um, you know, I thought about uh, the the topic that I was that I was asked to present on was talking about the the connection of um, oral health and uh, whole body health and how those how those intersect. Um, and there's lots of places where those um, where those come together. There's um, parts where um, where we'll refer, for example, um, when we do. When we do a routine, when we do a routine checkup at the dental office, we will uh, do some things that will also cross over with with medical. When medical does a does a physical screening, so we'll do a cancer screening of the head and neck area. We'll we'll palpate. We'll visually look for any kinds of spots, lesions, discolorations. We'll feel for any tenderness, lumps, bumps, that sort of stuff. Uh, we'll also do the health uh, the health history interview to talk about you know are you having any kinds of symptoms, jaw pain, all those all those sorts of things. Uh, we'll talk about nutrition counseling. Uh, we'll talk about their tobacco use. Uh, we'll do a screening for a blood pressure, and uh, we'll also review all their health history, medications, allergies, and a lot of times we'll catch we'll catch things that may not have been they may not have seen their physician for a while since they've come to us, um, and that's very common that we'll say you know this is this is a red flag you should you should be seeing your physician fairly soon. We'll also talk about uh, snoring if they're having tension headaches if they're having any temporal mandibular disorder, joint pain, um, things associated with that, uh, that falls into that category. So <clears throat> as a side note, um, this kind of dentists um, are kind of their own, their own breed. It's kind of, they're, they're very, um, there's a, famili a familial relationship. Usually it's you have a cousin or a father or somebody because from the outside, um, dentistry is kind of a strange profession. From the inside, if you are a dentist, it's very familiar. You know, I grew up with my father being a dentist, and it's very familiar. And so when you are a dentist, you see yourself kind of like this. You see yourself as um, the savior of teeth. You're, uh, you're, uh, you're making miracles happen. And um, 
uh, unfortunately, that's, uh, that's a, a lens that most people don't see dentists as. Dentists a lot of times see, uh, other, other people see dentists a lot of times uh, like this. When I was younger, just to bad as My mama noticed funny things I did. Like shooting puppies with a BB gun. I'd poison guppies when I was done. I'd find a pussy cat bash its hair. That's when my mama said. What did she say? She said, my boy, I think someday you'll find a way to make your natural tendencies pay. You'll be a dentist. You have a talent for causing pain. I'll be a dentist. People will pay you to be in you. So that's the opposite side of the spectrum. That's how some people see the dentist is, don't make me go to him. And uh, that's, that's a classic. The first time I saw that was when I went to dental school and I, I didn't know such, uh, such uh, quality entertainment was out there. And uh, so you're welcome to watch that on uh, Little Shop of Horrors at your, at your leisure. Okay, so in, uh, in a dental health check, er, in a, in a in a regular checkup, uh, when we have a new patient come in or when people are coming in for their routine exam, we will review, we'll review the health history that uh, reviews several systems. We'll talk about allergies uh, that they have, especially things to uh, allergies like latex, allergies to uh, penicillins, and those kinds of things that were, you know, are in the, the dental office. Um, there are, um, talking about tobacco and alcohol use, we know those increase risk of uh, certain kinds of cancers. Uh, we talk about any kind of cardiovascular or hematologic, if they have bleeding problems, are they on Coumadin, um, that, will that will affect how we treat them in certain cases. Um, if they have high blood pressure, that sort of thing. If they have uh, any history of infectious diseases, um, especially if they're cur anything current or active. Um, interestingly, uh, it shouldn't really, m some of these, unless they're in a contagious time frame, it doesn't really matter if they have HIV, if they have hepatitis. In, in, uh, in San Francisco, where, where the dental school was at, there was a, probably a higher than, than normal prevalence of HIV. However, this, this, you use the same precautions for everybody. You sterilize everything the same. You use the same, um, the same sterile technique. You use the same kinds of barriers and, and personal protection that you would use for anybody. So that when someone doesn't know that they are possibly a carrier for an infectious disease, um, you're going to be you're going to be safe either way. Um, radiation and bisphosphonates. This is an important piece of the health history review. Um, who knows, who knows the, the issue with bisphosphonates and, um, and, and dentistry or, um, or dental related issues? Cause degradation of your mandible. Okay, that's right. So bisphosphonates um, are in the categories of uh, medicines that help. There's, there's two different main categories that, that uh, we focus on. There's the osteoporosis medications um, like Boniva and uh, Zometa. And then there's, uh, there's IV versions that are much stronger that are usually used in cases of multiple myeloma. But what they do is it slows the turnover of the bone so that you're not losing, um, so you're, um, you're not losing the bone density as it's turning over and it's not replenishing the minerals. However, that comes into a problem if you take a tooth out and you need all that bone to rush in there and fill in and close off that area. If that bone around there is pretty much saying, you know, I've been told not to do anything, then the gingiva doesn't grow over it. You can get large areas uh, of the bone that, that uh, necrosis because it's, um, it's not Oh, it's not actively turning over. Uh, same, we can have the same issue with radiation if people have um, areas of, uh, especially in the head and neck where they have uh, focused, of, uh, focused radiation therapy, uh, usually for cancer treatment. Um, those areas, the bone gets degraded significantly and doesn't respond well. So in these cases, if we know someone has had a history of that, we will treat them, we'll treat them very conservatively. We'll treat them in ways that 
avoid at all cost manipulation of the bone. However, it's also good for everyone to be aware that if we know someone is going to need this in the future or the near future, um, they should have a dental checkup. We need to catch these things. Um, if, if things can be treated beforehand, if they've got wisdom teeth, it could be a problem in the next five years or something like that, then we would want to take care of those uh, aggressively preventatively um, so that these these won't cause the kinds of issues in the future that they could with, were those to come up. So we so people that were planning uh, on any radiation or, or bisphosphonate therapy we want to be very aggressive and, and make sure they have a, a dental clearance. Um, that happens very frequently with artificial joints, heart valves and, and things like that. We'll get a um, we'll frequently have people say come in and their the orthopedic surgeon or their cardiologist says I need a letter from you that says I'm in good dental health and we'll talk to them about the procedure they're undergoing and uh, make sure that they are, uh, that their dental health is optimal, that we don't have any areas that um, have been untreated or areas that are high risk that we would want to be maybe a little bit more aggressive. There's lots of things in dentistry that are very slow moving and we can kind of watch them and, and be a little bit um, a little bit conservative in treating them. Um, but when we know that, that we don't want to have to mess with those things or they're going to be more problematic messing with those things down the road, uh, then we'll be, we'll be a little bit more aggressive in, in treating those. Exercise, welcome to America. So, is that your anytime fitness? Okay. Um, other pieces of the dental checkup, nutrition counseling. Um, there's an interest, interesting piece about, um, you know, we, as, as medical and dental providers, we talk to people frequently about what are you eating and how much are you eating and that sort of thing. Um, the, the trick that can happen with people is they say, you know, I only have one cup of coffee or I only have one Gatorade or I only have one Mountain Dew, but if they drink it and they're sipping it all day long, that's actually worse as far as their dental health than if they would have a six pack of whatever that is and drink it at, you know, during a snack time or during lunch. And I'll talk to you about that specifically and it has to do with um, bringing the mouth into an acidic environment every time you put any kind of fermentable carbohydrate, any kind of refined sugars or any kind of, any kinds of acids brings your mouth into an acidic environment which slowly starts to dissolve the teeth away. Well, your saliva naturally will get you out of that zone. Um, if you're chewing sugar-free gum, that, I recommend that after meals. That stimulates the saliva flow and brings your, brings your mouth back into that safe zone. Um, but the longer that it's in that zone, and if you take a little sip of, sip of your uh, um, sugary drink or, um, or whatever it is throughout the day, you're keeping your mouth bathed in that acidic zone the whole day, and your teeth are just slowly dissolving away. So, and I'll show you that in a graph a little bit later on. We talk about balanced diet, uh, empty calorie foods and drinks, obviously, tobacco counseling. Um, some people think, well, a smokeless tobacco is better than you know, cigarettes, which for the lungs, that is true. However, for oral cancer, uh, we get a, um, for, for cancer of the head and neck and the, um, and the throat and tongue, uh, we get a three-fold increase over the regular population of incidence of oral cancer. And oral cancer is tricky to detect. Once you get past the tongue, it's hard to detect that until it starts to get big enough that it's really, really far along and uh, those don't have a very good survival rate. Uh, we do a blood pressure screening, and we say screening because we don't diagnose people with high blood pressure. We just uh, we take a, a, a ballpark of where they're at. Uh, we also have to take into account, uh, some people say, I'm always high when I go to the dentist, I'm always high when I go to the doctor, uh, so we take that into account. But as, as kind of a, a, a ballpark when people are you know, o over the, you know, 130, over 100, we'd say, well, you know, when's the last time you saw your physician? Is it normally this high? When's the last time it's been checked? Um, and if they're consistently um, in that range or below, or they say, yeah, I've been to my, I go to my physician regularly, they check it, they're not worried, then, then we're not worried either. Um, once it starts to get a little bit higher, and again, these are just kind of ballparks. We also, you know, if someone comes in and they're lethargic or they're breathing really heavy and we know that they're having a hard time, um, we get a little bit more insistent. Whereas if people seem to be in regular, you know, fairly good health, um, we, uh, we still recommend that they're following up with their, with their physician uh, regularly. Um, 
once it gets to 160 over 100 or 180 over 120, um, that's where it starts to get a bit more insistent. Sometimes we'll, we'll say, we can't, we can't proceed with what we're planning today. We need you to go to the ER. We need you to go to urgent care. You need to get this checked out because sustaining this at, a, at this high level for even a short amount of time is, is, wearing, out your, uh, is wearing out your blood vessels. Okay, so touching wires causes instant death. $200 fine. Death. Sometimes it's just not good enough. <coughs> okay, so a dental checkup. Most patients are seen every six months. Um, some people are seen more often than that that have periodontal disease that we are maintaining. Um, so my question would be, how often, and this is, this is actually an open question, how often do people routinely get a checkup at their physician, would you guess? I don't have an answer to this. I'm, I'm actually asking, what, what, would you, what would you say? Once a year. Once a year? Anyone think it's shorter than that? Longer than that, maybe? Okay, so it's at least you know once every once every year is, is is the people that are doing pretty good. They're you know they're coming in, they're supposed to be seeing a physician, they're getting their labs done. Especially once you get into those higher risk ages for for different kinds of things. Um, and uh, so it's it's nice that people um, come in to see the dentist every six months because we can review their health history. We can um, they typically see the dentist more often than we see the physician, um, and so we can catch red flags and, and hopefully, hopefully steer them toward the physician if we start to notice things uh, that, would be, that would be getting out of hand. Um, the head and neck exam, I think we talked about this. Uh, we can assess their tonsil airway. So what's the upside to keeping it clean? And, the, and the, the phrase keeping it clean means you have a healthy mouth, let's keep it a healthy mouth. Once it starts to degrade and then there's, then there's all kinds of problems trying to get it back on track, if we can get it back on track. Studies have shown that a routine cleaning with polishing will dramatically affect the kinds of bacterial colonies forming on the teeth, even if there's no current inflammation of the gums. So even if you have a completely healthy mouth, the mechanical polishing and removing of the surface layer of all those bacterial colonies that, that form on our teeth, disrupting that balance kind of throws them all into a throws them all into a panic, they have to reset everything, and it, uh, it changes the flora of the mouth and, and resets it to a more, a more positive experience. This was done by a study, um, this is still emerging evidence, um, this, was, this was given at a conference that, I've, that I went to this year, uh, where they're finishing up the study, but this is the emerging evidence, and it's kids with orthodontics, and they get these white spot lesions because they just can't keep the teeth clean. And they had this huge study with all these kids, and you can imagine it's like herding cats. And um, but but a lot of the things that that came out from this was that even even if they're bringing in the kids and they're just polishing off the teeth every you know every 12 weeks, um, every two months, uh, they see a significant improvement when they're when they're culturing the bacteria. They see a significant improvement even if there's not a visual degradation of the tissue or a visual degradation of the teeth. They're changing the oral environment, so they keep resetting the bacteria and pushing them back, so that they have to keep marching down the field all the way back to the to the to the end zone where they're going to be causing some problems. Um, so, the the good thing is this is happening in kids that do kind of a terrible job at cleaning their teeth, just because they're it's just not on their radar, um, and if, unless they have parents that are really um, you know, meticulous, and even me as a dentist, you can only be so meticulous on your kids before you're, you're just say that enough is enough. <coughs> so, um, if you're if you're cleaning your teeth very effectively, you're going to slow this this progression down quite a bit. But still, at that six month interval, again, you're getting a reset of all those of all those uh, bacteria that are in there. Even if everything's clean, you're doing a good job. Uh, so six month six month is ideal. Now open even wider, Mr. Stevens, just out of curiosity. We're going to see if we can also cram in this tennis ball. <laughs> Has anyone ever felt that way? I stick my stick your hand. Okay, so then the question is, okay, so is six months really necessary? Ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So the six month, um, some people 
can actually get away with not coming in every six months. But there, it's a fairly narrow zone. People that haven't had cavities within the last three years, no significant, significant medical changes or compromises, they have excellent oral hygiene and nutrition habits, and they're using fluoridated water and toothpaste. So that's a fairly narrow band of people that would fit into that that would probably be just fine coming in every year. Uh, but it's such a narrow band. And um, the downside, the only downside of coming in every six months is the, is the polish, you know, the, the cost and the time that it takes for that, for that exam. The upside, though, is obviously catching things that are small. When, you, when things are small, you can fix them. And again, that resetting so that you're, you're always pushing the bacteria back to, the, back to their, their end zone where they have to start their march all over again. Here's something that I thought was interesting that I read when I was, uh, when I was, pr was putting together this presentation. Dental decay is the most common chronic disease. Have you thought about it like that? The cost of providing corrective treatment is significantly more than providing preventative treatment. <clears throat> and what better way to look at that than insurance companies? They're always looking at the bottom line. What, how can we save money on, um, on what people are doing? So. There are some dental plans that the more often you go, and if you show a predilection of going frequently to the dentist, they will increase what they're paying on any treatment that needs to be done because statistically, they know that if you're going more often, your problems are going to be smaller, okay? All right, so here's a quick rundown of <coughs> uh, the teeth and gums and the health surrounding them. So. Every tooth that's a natural tooth emerges. Um, there is bone that supports it, and then there's gum tissue that drapes right over the top of the bone. When teeth are healthy, everything sits nice, nice up near the neck of the tooth. And when we take these, these nice little probes that everybody loves this, we check how deep those pockets are around the tooth. Ideally, we want those to be three millimeters or less. Anyone know why, besides my hygienist, why we want it to be three millimeters or less? Any ideas? Less stuff. Less stuff. Okay. There's less of a, of a pocket for stuff to get jammed into. Okay. You can only fit so big of a popcorn kernel in there. Okay. Any other ideas? The reason that three millimeters or less is kind of our target zone is that that's the area you can keep clean. Your toothbrush bristles can effectively, when you're massaging the gums, can effectively clean to a depth of about three millimeters. Once you get past three millimeters, you can scrub all day long as hard as you can, and those bristles just aren't going to get down in there. Okay. Um, so once we get gingivitis, we start to get inflammation. So plaque builds up along the, the margins or, or, or along the edges of the teeth. The gums get inflamed. Just like if you get a sliver in your finger, all that tissue around that sliver is reacting to the bacteria that's in that. And your body um, is setting up an inflammatory response saying, we don't like what's going on here. Loosen up the tissue. Send, uh, send all your uh, uh, host response and uh, the area gets inflamed. And ironically, the, the body, by trying to repair it, makes things worse. If the body would just say, chill out, nobody do anything, nobody move, these things, you know, the, the pockets would stay that way. But instead, they get inflamed. And when they get inflamed and puffy, who wants to brush their teeth when they're bleeding? Everybody loves to do that, right? You floss and you say, ah, it's bleeding. Bleeding means. I need more attention, but most people think, ah, I'm doing something wrong. And so they don't touch it. They stay away from it. And what happens to those bacteria that then are sinking down in there? They dig a little deeper, it gets worse, and it's this progressive stage. So when you come in to see us and we're catching them at this stage, that's when we educate people about um, making sure to brush those areas they're bleeding, even though they're tender. We want to get rid of that inflammation. We want things to heal up. Well, the body, what the body is, is thinking is the tooth that's covered with bacteria that it doesn't like, it wants to get rid of it. So if we progress along this track, what's the body eventually going to do with the tooth? It's going to push it out. That's what the body's trying to do over time. So we're trying to convince the body, no, we like them. We want our teeth to stay here, please. So, but to do that, we have to, we have to treat the, we have to, 
make sure that the tooth is healthy. We have to clear off the bacteria off of the tooth so that it's not an invasive or a foreign body because if it's covered with bacteria, it is essentially a foreign body and your, and your body wants to shoot it out. Okay? And uh, here's where the phrase long in the tooth comes from. As people used to get older and older, well, they still do this. Not as, not as prevalent, but, you know, periodontitis, the teeth get longer and longer um, as, as they aged. Um, and there's your, there's your long in the tooth. So <clears throat> once we get past four and five millimeter pockets, it becomes even more tricky for us to clean. Once we get to these really, really deep pockets, there's almost nothing we can do. Then we have to be very aggressive we have to reposition the gums. We have to reposition the bone. Or it may be a, a tooth that's not worth saving. Um, it's not worth the expense and, and what we're going to get out of it um, to save it. And so that's when, that's when we recommend taking out teeth. Hopefully it's only one tooth at a time, but sometimes it's a, it's a full mouth like a case like this. There's really nothing to do for that. Okay. All right. So, periodont so the, the definition is teeth are healthy. Gingivitis is just inflammation of the gums. Periodontitis is where we get inflammation of the gums, but it's starting to affect the bone. Um, and it's irreversible, it's irreversible bone loss. That's why we don't want to get to that point. Uh, it causes bad breath, tooth mobility. Um, and this is the big player when we're talking about oral systemic connection. When we're talking about all these studies that come out and all this uh, all this hype that comes out about you know your mouth being related to your body health and, and vice versa, it's mainly talking about this. It's not usually talking so much about cavities. It's not usually so much talking about broken teeth or abscesses. It's almost exclusively lined into periodontitis and inflammation of the gums and destruction of the bone. So that's what we, that's what we'll be looking at specifically with this oral systemic connection. And uh, <coughs> this chap came in last week. To our office, and uh, these these uh, these are not teeth right here. He has been flossing, though. You can see where he's been flossing. Can everyone see where he's been flossing through the calculus bricks that are in there? So this is all mineral deposits that plaque as it as it goes on the teeth. Your saliva deposits mineral in there, and it hardens, and that's what we call plaque, or that's what we call calculus or tartar. So this is, this is hard mineral deposits that eventually will get all that cleaned off. But you can see he's got some significant issues around here. Once we clean all that off, the gum tissue will heal up and we'll kind of have an idea of what we're looking at as far as, as, far as the deep pockets once we, once we clear everything out as, as well as we can. OK, so in the Journal of the American Dental Association just a few months ago, there's, a, there's an article entitled Paradigm Periodontitis, the canary in the coal mine. Who knows what the canary in the coal mine is referenced to? Indication that we're all going to die. <laughs> uh, right. Right. So miners would take a canary down with them. And canaries got little tiny lungs, little fast breather. And if the canary dropped over dead, they knew there was some, they had got some kind of gas or something was going on down there that they're like, we got to get out of here. So the canary was the first one to, to sacrifice himself so that everybody else knew, get the heck out of there. Okay? So periodontitis in this category is kind of the canary for some of these, uh, some of these other underlying um, issues. The strongest evidence for periodontal disease potentially having an effect on systemic disease exists for the relationship between these three things. Diabetes mellitus, atherosclerotic cerebrocardiovascular disease, and adverse pregnancy outcomes. So those are the three major ones. There's some other ones that I'll talk about briefly, um, but those are, the, those are the major players that the emerging evidence is the most strong concerning. Um, periodontitis is often more prevalent, progresses more rapidly, and is more severe in people with diabetes. Okay. So the emerging evidence says that people with poor periodontal health have an increased risk for these, well, let me, let me hit these one at a time. Poor glycemic control for type 2 diabetes. So anyone who has periodontal disease and type 2 diabetes, statistically, they have a harder time maintaining their glycemic control or their, or their, their blood sugar levels. Diabetes 1 and 2, anyone that has periodontal disease, and again, the more severe the periodontal disease, the more striking these, uh, these relationships are. But they will have diabetes-related complications. And we know that there's several complications uh, related to diabetes. There's um, 
uh, problem with your eyes, retinopathy, neuropathy, problem with nerves, um, problems with uh, the uh, peripheral vascular disease, cardiovascular disease, um, and uh, problems with the kidneys. So those will all be increased, the incidence is increased with people that have concurrent periodontal disease. We have people that have high periodontal disease, that population has a higher turnover into new manifest diabetes. People that are not diabetic that have periodontal disease, that population has a higher incidence of progressing into diabetes. And people who are non-diabetic still have a harder time maintaining their blood glucose levels if they have periodontal disease. Okay. So here's, uh, here's an interesting finding. When there is mechanical periodontal therapy, that's when we go down and we scrape out all the bugs. We call that scaling and root planing um, because we're, we're planing the roots and we're, we're taking the bacteria off of the roots of the teeth. When there's a, <clears throat> once they've been cleaned for three months, there's a significant decrease in the HbA1c. It's actually, um, so HbA1c is the glycosylated hemoglobin, which kind of measures how well your body is regulating the, the sugar in your blood. So if this is a really high number, you're getting out of control, your body is not maintaining, it's got too much sugar and it's not being able to put it away where it needs to be. The it clinical, the amount that it, that it reduces it is the clinical impact of adding a second drug to the regime for people who are type 2 diabetes. Okay, so it's a, it's a fairly significant amount. I think this, the, the number is 0.4. It can reduce the HbA1c by 0.4, almost, almost a, a half, half a point. However, if you look on the other side of the street, diabetes affecting people that have periodontitis, there's a, there's a cross back as well. It's not just the periodontitis being the only bad player you know, going against the people that have diabetes, but it's, it's conversely. When people have diabetes, there's an increased prevalence of extent and severity of gingivitis and periodontitis. So, so people that were healthy, they're going to develop the periodontitis uh, more severely. Um, they also, um, let's see, so people that have both have two chronic conditions, each of which are affecting each other, and the increased risk of periodontitis with poor uh, glycemic control. Tradition, just because you've always done it that way, it doesn't mean it's not incredibly stupid. <laughs> so think about that. And you're, sometimes in, when, uh, when you're doing something in your, in your work and they say, well, that's the way we've always done it, you can say, well, that, you know, go to Pamplona and show me, show me how, to, how it's done. Okay, There's the, the second one is the association um, between... Um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. This one's very interesting because they found live and viable periodontal bacteria, bacteria that are specific to periodontal disease, within atheromas, or the plaques that are um, occluding arteries, okay, wherever they are, whether they're in the brain or in the heart. They have those exact bacteria that have traveled from the mouth into the bloodstream and have gotten, uh, have gotten to those areas. So we know that they're, that they're correlated and they're they're playing in the wrong field. They're soccer players that are over in the swimming pool or, or whatever. So periodontal treatment reduces the systemic level of inflammation as measured by C-reactive protein levels and improved endothelial function. So when people are treated just like their HbA1c levels get a little bit better under control, treating periodontal disease, their C-reactive protein also goes down, which is, our, which is our measure of inflammation, which can be an indicator for the formation of these, uh, of these plaques and atheromas. Uh, here lies the rub. So even though that's, that's some really great, great evidence, we would also call this what's called emerging evidence. So we hear a lot about this, um, and, and anytime, uh, anytime the newspapers like, get a hold of a little, a little bit of a little study and they, they blow it out of proportion and they say, you know, go to your dentist or you're going to die from you know, heart disease or you're going to die from this or that. Okay? This is, the, this is the, uh, the, end, the end result. The association, an association shows a link between two, two conditions. It doesn't say which is causing which. We don't know. We know that they're associated. We know that they rise and fall and have problems together. But it could be due to a different factor that influences both conditions that we don't even know about. Okay? So we know they're related. We know that treating one helps another one. 
but there may be, it just may be A and B, and C is out there influencing both of them. Um, at least we know that, we can, that we're having some control by controlling A and B, um, but it's still an association. We don't have, we don't have the direct channels that are, that are showing that. There's, there's good promise, and, and then there's still emerging evidence of that. Um, so <laughs> this is, and this is in the Journal of the American Dental Association, because they don't want dentists going out there saying, you better come to your dental visit or you're going to die. Um, Stating that periodontal disease causes a plethora of non-oral diseases cannot be supported by the existing evidence. Chances are a person prone to periodontitis have related sy system and conditions and vice versa. Thus, periodontal disease can be a marker or canary for greater general health issues. Okay, so that's the, that's the take home message is that um, they're associated. We want to, they help us be aware of each other. If you have someone coming in that has uncontrolled diabetes, you want to say, you know, have you been to your dentist lately? Because if that's getting out of control, it's going to get out of control much faster than someone who's a normie, normal, uh, normal, healthy, controlled adult. Quality control. Sometimes falling asleep on the job results in awesomeness. <laughs> yeah, I like that one. <coughs> yeah. So. <coughs> This is the this is the third category. This one is less this one is less strong. This is the less strong correlation. Okay, preterm low weight uh, low birth weight babies. We're still unsure of the relationship and the strength because there's been there's a, a few early studies that show really strong correlation between women that had periodontal disease and preterm and low weight babies, uh, low birth weight babies. Um, but then they did some other ones and they completely contradicted it. So there's, there's a whole bunch of studies that have been done. They're trying to design studies that show it a little bit better, but there's been some con um, contradicting evidence. Um, so there's some associations, but they're modest and they seem to depend on the population, the choice of case definition, so you know, what they're actually studying, what they're, what they're weeding out. So it's a little harder, harder to figure this one out. Uh, they haven't consistently demonstrated that treating periodontitis can affect uh, the rates of preterm birth or low birth weight. There, there's lots of other factors included with that. So periodontitis not being a really big player, but still possibly a contributing factor, at least to be aware of. Um, let's see here. So <clears throat> when we're thinking about, so those are the, that's the, those are the major players as far as the oral systemic connection um, and things that are directly related as far as periodontal disease and our overall health and diseases that we can have. Now there's some, um, this is some, uh, more of some kind of back to the screening idea that we can have oral symptoms when, when people come to the dentist, we can see things that may show us, may give us an indication that something else is going on, okay? We have something called hairy leukoplakia that showed up out of the blue. We had all this incidence of it happening back in, I think it was the late 80s or something. And that's when HIV and, and AIDS started coming on and, we, and there was a significant prevalence of that. And that was, that was helpful in people being screened and saying, you know, we don't see this except for, you know, people that have active HIV. You should probably go get checked and, and that sort of thing. Uh, herpes simplex virus, cold sores, that's a pretty common deal. Uh, the mumps, again, we have vaccinations for that, so that's not too big a deal. Oral candidiasis or thrush, I see that, I see that uh, a few times a year where people have white patches on their tongue, stings, um, and most of the time they're taking uh, some sort of corticosteroid in an inhaler. Uh, but if they don't, if they're not taking an inhaler, if there's no good reason why they would have, um, you know, fungus growing on their tongue, uh, then we'll have, we'll, we'll have them go to the physician and maybe check some other things. Maybe they're immunocompromised in some other way. Sjogren's syndrome is where uh, there's, uh, it's more of the tear ducts and the saliva together, but they get really dry mouth. Terrible, terrible to have that and also have to take some medications that are going to dry out your mouth because they, they don't have a, they have a pretty hard time. This is something that we notice quite a bit. We notice, <coughs> not quite a bit, but now and again we notice erosion on the teeth, chemical erosion uh, that isn't explained by any other way. Um, it's, it's not grinding, it's not, um, so, and we'll ask them, you know, do you, do you eat certain kinds of acids? Are you chewing on citrus? Some people are what's called fruit molars. Well, they'll chew on a piece of fruit, a piece of citrus, and it just, the acid just eats away their teeth. Uh, but it could be uh, gastroesophageal reflux. 
It could be bulimia. That one's kind of a touchy subject, but sometimes you gotta you, you gotta ask them those pointed questions. You know, how often are you throwing up? And um, then there can be environmental and diet things. Environmental, you know, there there can be instances where there's something strange in the water that, that it gets picked up by. Um, you know, there's there's too much uh, too much chlorine, or someone who's a who's a heavy swimmer can also have uh, excessive erosion on their teeth. So I'm kind of a I'm kind of a a Star Wars nerd as well as nerd of many other things as you've noticed. But so this one says lightsaber, the coolest weapon ever. Search your feelings, you know that it is true. <laughs> okay. Um, Oral disease can affect treatment for systemic disease. Um, for example, if someone is having um, mucositis or inflammation and sloughing of their gum tissues, um, that can affect the duration that they're able to tolerate chemotherapy. If you just, if they're getting to the point where they can't eat, they can't, you know, they can't maintain nutrition, they can't maintain weight, they may have to take them off chemotherapy a little bit earlier. Um, if people are having xerostomia that's just uncontrolled. Um, Luckily, we have lots of medications um, that some that we can try to find for the same for the same diseases, and a lot of times we can switch them to something else that may not hit them as hard uh, with xerostomia. Xerostomia being a dry mouth, persistent dry mouth, um, and you know, dry mouth is is no fun to begin with, but it also is highly high risk for getting cavities. You know, there's nothing to wash the bacteria off. There's nothing to neutralize the acid in there, um, and so they, they have a they have a have a hard time. Um, I talked about this a little bit before. Um, anyone who has joint replacement, radiation therapy, bisphosphonate therapy, um, that is that is planned, it should be they should get a dental clearance just to make sure there's no there's no major players that, that we would want to we would want to get get taken care of first. Um, so for when we're when we're talking about age groups, there's uh, the elderly um, start to start to have a harder time with compliance. You know, you have uh, kids that are learning to brush, and then once we get to a certain point, we start forgetting to brush uh, on purpose, or not on purpose, but uh, just because we're forgetting lots of things. Um, and we're never too old to be encouraged about oral hygiene. Um, everyone who comes to, to the dental office, there's usually a tip or a trick that we can uh, that we can share with them. My tip for today is a Sonicare. I'm not a paid sponsor of Sonicare. I just use it and I love it. So, Sonicare uh, works by. You can hear that. It's a little humming. Sounds like angry bees, but uh, it has a high frequency vibration and massages the teeth. And I can't get my teeth as clean ever, ever, unless I'm using a Sonicare. I can brush all day long with a manual toothbrush. I've tried other kinds of mechanical uh, types, but Sonicare is by far my favorite. It's kind of pricey, but if it saves you one cavity throughout your whole life, it pretty much pays for itself. So I recommend Sonicare. The other thing that's nice about Sonicare is it doesn't take manipulation. So if you get someone who's elderly who has a hard time uh, holding on to something, you press the button, you got a big old stick to hold on to, and they just have to go around and massage the gums. It does a lot of the work for you. Okay? So I really like the Sonicare. You can come up and play with that after if you'd like. Um, <coughs> aspiration pneumonia is, uh, is, can be an, it, uh, an issue with the elderly. If they have a lot of bacteria that are hanging out in their mouth, you think of them breathing, breathing that in all, all day long, especially if they're on some sort of a respirator where bacterial colonies are just hanging around there. Um, you know, Several studies show that daily mechanical oral hygiene reduces the prevalence and, or, um, and colonization of oral pathogens. Um, so it's important for people that, even the people that you don't think, you know, they're, they're not very mobile, they're not doing a whole lot. Um, it's not just the teeth that we're saving. You know, there's, we, we want to um, keep those bacteria from colonizing in their, um, in their lungs for sure. Okay, so there are some things for um, for the medical side to consider supporting the dental side. First of all, encourage the first dental or happy visit by the time the first tooth comes in. We call them happy visits just because we can. That's really the only reason. <coughs> and most of the time, the kids do pretty good. We had a three-year-old that came in today, and she let me she let me look at her teeth, and, and she did a good job. Most of the time, this first visit is for the parent to answer any questions that the parent has, give them some pointers, some tips. Um, we talk about nutrition habits. Frequency is our nemesis. Um, so here's this graph that I promised you. 
Here is where our, where our mouth is in a neutral pH. Once you get down below 5.5, 5, uh, 5 the environment is acidic enough that the teeth begin to dissolve away. Okay? As, they, <coughs> as you eat your breakfast, anything that you put on there, your Cocoa Puffs or your, or your Fruit Loops, is going to plunge your to teeth into an acidic environment. Your saliva is going to slowly work your mouth out of that into the safe zone, and then the mineral in your saliva will build back onto the teeth and will reverse the process. Then you plunge it in again for lunch, and then you have a soda, and you plunge it in again. Can you imagine someone sipping a Monster or a Mountain Dew or any kind of sugary beverage, even a Gatorade or something that's healthy like fruit juice, sipping that all day long? They're just going to be hanging out down here the whole day. Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's what to be aware of, that frequency is more of a nemesis as far as the teeth are concerned than the quantity. And there's some, there's some balance as far as um, what helps teeth be happy, what, what promotes decay. So we talked about dietary habits, absence of saliva, uh, xerostomia, that's, that's a, a player on the bad side. Uh, sealants, uh, sealants seal off grooves and pits. We, we recommend that on all kids because 90% um, of cavities that show up by the time someone is 18 occur on the biting surface of the teeth. And they're completely preventable with a simple procedure where we just seal up those little grooves. It's like putting grout uh, in between your tiles. It just seals that up from, from any jazz from getting down in there. Okay. Uh, fluoride, everybody should be drinking fluoridated water um, and using fluoridated toothpaste. Um, and an, eff an, eff an, eff an effective diet. You're not dying, I guess, but um, there you go. Encourage good habits. Avoid taking your bottle or sippy to bed. It's very handy. Um, it's very tempting. Your child likes to have the bottle that soothes them to go to bed, um, but there's something called baby bottle carries. Um, crazy enough, some people put uh, Coca-Cola in their bottles. That's, that's a... Uh, that's something I noticed uh, that's uh, more of a uh, kind of a Latino uh, thing, but uh, you know, carrying around the Coca-Cola in the bottle and, and there's, no, there's no teeth left, everything's just rotted off at the gum line. And it's, again, it's the frequency. Um, and a kid falling to bed with a bottle in their mouth or a pooled milk, even milk pooling in their mouth is just gonna let those bacteria just chew on those teeth all, day, all, all night long, okay? Fluoridated water. Brush for them until how old? How old do you brush their teeth? I still brush my eight-year-old's teeth just because I want to know what's going on in there. But you brush for them until they're able to effectively clean, your teeth, clean their teeth. How do you assess that? The easiest way to assess that is those little, those little chew tabs where you say, okay, brush your teeth. Every once in a while you check, okay, how are you brushing your teeth? You have them brush their teeth, chew on all those little chew tabs, and then you both look in the mirror and you see where all the places, the little friendly spots are where they left them. Well, this is, this is one way that when you're brushing for them still, um, you can make sure that they are compliant. This is my 18-month-old. And uh, I, I put my, my thighs on her arms. Her legs are down. She's just like she's in a dental chair. And uh, she loves this. She, she's happy, happy as a clam. Now... Uh, She's the fourth kid, though. She sees all the other kids doing it, and she's totally happy with it. The first kid we tried to do this to, it was about two months of screaming while she was doing this before she got used to it. She did get used to it. Um, it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't torture or waterboarding. But the nice thing is when they're screaming, their mouth is open the whole time. So it's very, it's very efficient uh, to, get them, to get them clean. So this is my little boy then here. Um, he just wanted to demonstrate that below. He does fine up on top. And so even when she's, even when she's doing her little, her little pike kicks, she, uh, this, is, this is Rue again. And she was, just out, she was actually having a ball. She was just kicking her feet up, like to kick her feet up. But uh, you know, that's me demonstrating the correct, the correct opening procedure. Uh, but uh, so easy, easy to brush her teeth. Here's my other kids. They get to sit on top. Once they, once they are well behaved, they can sit on top. So they, it's a reward to sit still because you get to sit on top. I like it when they sit on top because then I don't have to lean over as much. Um, so that's, that's nice. And really, she'll actually sit on top and sit, sit pretty still um, because she's seen all of her siblings do it. Um, but this is a very effective technique. 
when I try to describe it to parents, sometimes they think, oh, it's terrible. They're, you know, prepare them. They're going to scream, but they'll get used to it, and, they, and they, uh, it's a very effective way to brush their teeth. And then there's my oldest. Uh, again, she's eight years old, and I still like to know what's going on in there. Who's awesome? <laughs> You're awesome. <laughs> Isn't that the cutest little puppy? OK, so other things for medical providers. Don't be afraid to get in there, dig around, get familiar with yourself. Look at the teeth, gums, tongue, cheeks. Take a look at everyone that comes through there, and then you'll get used, you'll start to get used to what's normal. Then when you see that, that chap that was there the other day that had the, those big old bricks of calculus in there, you'll notice, OK, that's, something's not quite right there. I should probably see if the, the dentist needs to take a look at this. Encourage good oral hygiene in the parents. Um, the parents are the best indicator. There's a high correlation between a mother's oral flora, the bacteria in her mouth, and the child's bacteria. There's a direct vertical link of the kinds of bacteria that they get. Because they share spoons, they lick off the pacifier, they have fingers in their mouth, etc. So it's nice if the mother has a very low risk for cavities because she'll pass those kinds of bacteria onto her kids that are pretty inert. Um, but the, the, the same problem can, uh, can come around. Here's an interesting study. There was, uh, there's some pregnant mothers in Scandinavia that chewed two grams of xylitol gum, which is a ton of gum. This is almost, un it was a study, it was in Scandinavia where they had, um, where they had uh, universal health care, and so they just made these women do this, and so they had to chew all this gum, and it creates diarrhea and all this, all this crazy stuff. But xylitol, bacteria hate xylitol, and so their mouths got almost devoid of bacteria, so that when they stopped, they stopped the reg so they so they did this. I think the six the last six months of their pregnancy, the kids the kids in this group for two years afterwards had a decreased prevalence of cavities. So just by the mom having a clean mouth at the at the out of the gate for the child, they had for two years they statistically had a lower risk of cavities than than their counterpart population. Okay, so that, that stresses the point of make sure the mom is, is doing good and, and has, a, has a clean mouth. Captain James T. Kirk, I'm sorry I can't tell you over the sound of how awesome I am. <laughs> I love James T. Kirk. Okay. Pregnancy, it's okay to see the dentist when you're pregnant. Some people think, I don't need to go to the dentist, or he's, he's going to give me x-rays, and I don't want them, or he's going to dig around in there, it's going to hurt my gums, or that sort of thing. It's okay to come see us. Do hormonal changes. The deterioration in the health of the teeth and gums can be more rapid um, in, uh, when we're pregnant. X-rays are okay, but we postpone them. If it's just a screening x-ray, we want to postpone it. Here's some, here's some information on x-rays that may be uh, FYI. Current digital x-rays require a third the dosage that we used to use. Okay? When we take four by wings, which is four shots that check for cavities in between the teeth, it's two to three microsieverts. You don't really need to know what that means, except for if you travel in an airplane at 39,000 feet, the radiation that comes from the atmosphere from the sun is five microsieverts per hour. So one hour in an airplane is less than getting your four bite wings. So if the dentist says you should get four bite wings because we want to look for decay, the comparison, it's, it's, not, a whole lot, it's not a whole lot of radiation. Any radiation is is not good, but in this case, it, uh, the, the benefits usually outweigh the, uh, the risk. Usually, we get background radiation from the ground, from the sun, from everything, and we get 3,600 3, microsieverts. So that, again, it's a comparison that the amount of radiation is extremely small. And for people that work around nuclear reactors and that kind of stuff, they wear the special little tags, and they're supposed to stay below a certain level, they can get up to 20,000 a year because, once you, because you don't show any visible effects up till about 50,000 a year, okay? So extremely small amounts of, of radiation. Here's the last thing about pregnancy. There's these things called pregnancy tumors, a little bump on the gums, and that's just because the, again, the hormonal changes just allow for the swelling of the gums to just kind of go crazy. They're called pyogenic granuloma, which is a total misnomer. Pyogenic means pus, and granulomatous means bacteria, which it has neither. So it's just a buildup of inflammatory tissue um, that 
once the mouth is, this only happens when, when bacteria is not well, uh, uh, well cleaned off of, of these areas. We're not exactly sure what causes it. You know, increase in progesterone causes certain bacteria to grow, making uh, the gum tissue more sensitive to plaque, et cetera. Um, when we're talking about pregnancy, it's ideal to do routine treatment during the second trimester. The first trimester is when a lot of this specific structures are forming in the fetus, especially neurological structures that we want to just let everything go as smooth as possible. We don't want to traumatize the mother. Um, we would, you know, anything that's emergency, you know, if they're an abscess or something, we would definitely take care of that. But if anything is, is elective or can be pushed off to the second trimester, that's ideal. The third trimester, again, we try to avoid that just because they're uncomfortable. And um, if we get too close to, uh, to, to labor, we can, we can uh, induce them with uh, trauma. Mm -hmm. Emergencies are assessed at a case by case. Elective, functional, or minimally invasive are postponed until after delivery. Cookies, every dentist's worst nightmare. And that's all. That's it.